Hi everyone, welcome to our 19th, uh, this love and time of Corona wine tasting session. I'm going to go through it again. Um, many of you have heard it 19 times or 18 times, um, but just for those who haven't. So this whole thing is about exploring wines for, for people that like wine, but are often intimidated by wine when they walk into the wine shop. And it started off when um, before lockdown, when Nats and Craig sent me a picture of the wine they were drinking, and then I said, well, that looks delicious. Let me tell you about it. And this is the wine we're drinking. And I sent them a picture and they said that looks delicious. And so from then we decided that it would be a good idea for us to go and buy seven wines from Pick and Pay. The idea was that it would be online, but the delivery was only going to take place like four weeks later. Um, of really accessible wines and wines that uh, I think they were between 80 and 100 bucks or 120 bucks. And that's where this spawned. And the idea wasn't, it's not an educational thing, but it's, uh, it's about sharing information. It's about uh, telling stories and it's about socializing in this sort of self-isolation environment. And what's important about it is it's, 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 give, it's building relationships for people that um, maybe have one or two go-to wines, but giving them a, a repertoire of wines that they can go to, but not only be comfortable with the wine in, in what it tastes like, but know the stories, know the personality of the wines. And this has morphed and it's grown. It started messy. And I like that idea. You just start messy, just get it going. And it's slowly improving. And uh, as I've said just now, with the survey, we're going to slowly improve it a little bit more, but hopefully without losing the, the pulse of it and the heart and the feel of it. So, yeah, and, 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 and this, this fits in with the philosophy that wine's a social tool. And, and us humans are gregarious and we need to interact, we need to engage. And part of that is telling stories. And wine goes with the telling of the stories, it goes with a meal, and with a couple of glasses, it makes you clever. So, this is why. Um, and this is, this is why we're here. So I'm really delighted to have Johan on. And you'll remember those guys who've been on this for a long time, that Johan was our second session. So he was still very much in the messy stage. I, I think that um, we're not going to be so messy now. But um, we, knew, we never knew we were going to get the winemakers on. And now we've had quite a lot on. We've had, this is the 13th winemaker out of 19, uh, wine producer. and um, so I'm glad to, to have uh, Johan on. And um, we've spoken about the, the wines, but we've spoken about them from me, not from you. And I bet you that you know more than I do about your wines. Um, <laughs> the other thing is, um, I was just reading on the internet, and this Johan is from, I can't remember where he's from, I think he's from Woz, no, he's from Wineland Magazine. And he wrote, I love the sentence he wrote, he said that Johan's both an intrepid idealist and an unassuming realist. Jan Reinek is the pragmatic philosopher farmer of the industry, widely regarded as one of the first pioneers of organic and biodynamic farming in South Africa. Um, those are a lot of big words, so I would never have been able to come up with a sentence like that. My sentence, <laughs> Jan, is that he's the silver surfer of the wine industry. He's the silver surfer of biodynamic. He's definitely a pioneer. And um, I met him when I did my thesis for uh, the Cape Wine Masters. And he called me in and I was a little bit nervous because I didn't know, know him and I didn't know why he was taking me into his house. It was a bit scary. And he gave me noodles and we spoke about, we spoke for about two or three hours. I don't know, I can't even remember long. It's, but but it, was just, it was just, it could go on forever and I was just sucking it in like a sponge. So it's nice to have you on, Jan. How are you? Hi, oh, Harry. Thanks for having me, man. What a privilege. And it looks like such a fun group. Um, Really happy to be here, to be a part of it. I don't know where you guys are, but I'm looking out over a late autumn afternoon here in Stellenbosch. It was a beautiful day, very little wind. Um, it's just such a nice time on the farm this time of the year, you know, all that tension of spring and the hard work of, of, of pruning in winter and then grinding through harvest and now everything has calmed down and it's rained a bit and the cows are happy and everybody's relaxing and taking in the nice weather so very special time on the farm uh, this time of the year. I wish I wish I could just 
bring all of you here to experience experience it, you know, real time. But hopefully that will happen in future. Are, are, the, all... the, are the cows in lockdown? Can they get out? <laughs> now the cows, they never in lockdown. They they need to eat and drink 365 a year. So they, but they're awesome. They're very special. Uh, we had our first calf for the season come the day before yesterday. A beautiful little girl, a heifer. So very happy to see. A little bit early. Um, we're still waiting for a bit more rain. We had nice rain around Easter. But it would be great if we could have some rain and get the cover crop to grow proper in the vineyard so I can put them in there and fatten them up for dentin. Good luck. Cool, man. So let's, let's, let's get started. You know, I think that uh, let's give it 15 minutes of stories or a little bit uh, around there and then we'll go into the questions. So let's, let's start off about the farm. It's your father's farm. And I think it was called Eitzicht or... Yeah, so Harry, so when I, I was born in the northern part of the country and in my primary school years, my dad got a job at UCT. And in my matric year, he got a teaching post offered at Stellenbosch. So they moved to uh, this, uh, well, not the house that I'm sitting in now. This used to be a farm shed. Um, yeah, that's, that's actually the view from my window. That's the, when I look out this window, that's exactly what I see. So my parents moved here in 1988. And then I studied, um, I started off studying law. I fell in love with philosophy of all weird things to fall in love with. I struggled to get a job, you know, there are not many oaks looking for philosophers to employ. So I ended up getting a, <clears throat> a job as a, as a farm laborer in this area. And I was still studying at the time, um, but I was doing my master's. So I was doing a, a thesis that I could work on in the evenings. And then in the daytime, go out and prune and, and work in the vineyards. And at the time, my mom was running Stellenbosch Hospice. And she was a proper farm girl. So she came from a farm and she was managing this farm. And it got to a point where, yeah, she just said, you know, it's enough. Uh, do you want to take over? And then I migrated from a, a roving uh, laborer on a number of farms to being lucky enough to become a, a farmer uh, on, our, on our own farm. That was sort of in the mid 90s, uh, 95 to 97. And then around about 98, uh, two things happened. I you know, I always say to people, it's, it's quite different being a farm worker than being a farmer. If you're a farmer, you can sort of decide what people need to do and delegate and follow up at a later stage. But if you're a worker, you rock up at work in the morning and someone tells you what to do. And back in the day, most people in this area, including myself, were conventional farmers. And um, I loved all of it except the use of, you know, the, the poisons and the chemicals and things. Um, from a worker perspective, I didn't feel comfortable using them on a daily basis. So I wanted to step away from that. And at the yeah, time, I, I was remember, also... I, yeah. I, remember, I remember you saying to me that you were working and the reality of the poisons dripping down the back of your leg. Yeah, you know, look, we, we, you wore overalls and, and things like that. But if you wore a backpack and you were spraying, some of the stuff would run down your back and it would run down the back of your leg. And I mean, I'm still here today, um, but I had a, it, it just, it wasn't nice. It wasn't a nice way to farm. And then in the evenings, I was reading the works of two, two people at the time. The one was a guy called Aldo Leopold. And he was an American environmentalist. He wrote a book called The Sand County Almanac. And the other guy was a Norwegian guy, Arnie Ness. And as I was getting into their work and what they were writing about nature and about ourselves and our role in nature, I wanted to start, it, you know, living differently and, and farming differently. But at the time, it was much frowned upon. It was seen as very risky. Um, I, we were financially selling very close to the wind at the time as well. So the bank manager said, you know, you're already struggling. I, I wouldn't advise you to go just yet 
And then I explained to him why I wanted to. And I started on a small little quarter of a hectare just outside my house here. I uh, failed dismally for, I would say, at least a year or two. And then slowly but surely got the hang of it. And yeah, just kept on going. Yeah, I'm still on going. You, you, you likened it. I remember, I remember you mentioned a, a woman who was highly influential. She's passed away, Jean Malherbe. And I remember you saying that, you know, it's like these, these vineyards have, are like teenagers or however old they are, and they've been taking drugs in the form of pesticides, fungicides, and fertilizers. And then you stopped. You took it away. And the vineyards started going cold turkey on you for these two years. Mm. And the bank manager didn't like a cold turkey teenager who was behaving <laughs> erratically. Yeah, you know, and I'm, I'm laughing, but it's serious because you know, I'm a, a big advocate for sustainable farming. But to me, and I've learned this, it's kind of been forged over the years. Sustainability is a three legged chair. You have to look after nature and you have to look after people but you also have to look after money. Um, you can sort of almost exploit nature the longest and get away with it and then people. But when you run out of money, things go south quickly. And I've been there a few times. So I'm very hesitant to go there again. Um, but you're right. The lady who, who, who helped me was, was Jean, Jean Malherbe. And she lived on a farm called Blau Blomikis Kloof. I mean, I asked that for a beautiful name. It's a farm in Wellington, and it was a certified biodynamic farm, which is a very old form of organics uh, that's been practiced. And she came to our farm, into my vineyards, and it was a complete mess. And I said to her, John, please help me. You know? And she said, well, where would you like to start? And then I said, well, perhaps we can start with these weeds because it likes us a you know, It's very unneat, and the weeds are growing taller than the vineyards. And, the chochos are climbing from the weeds into the vines, and it's just quite what I envisaged with my organic dream. And she's, you know, she said, yes, okay, so what do you want to do? And so I said, well, I used to spray the, the grasses with Roundup and all the broadleaves with MCPA. Now, what is like an organic thing I can spray with, or do I plow them or mow them, or how do I get rid of them? And she said to me, no, young man, um, you must understand your farm is a book and these weeds are letters in this book, and uh, you must learn to read again. And she was an elderly lady at the time, and she spent the rest of that day walking the vineyards with me and shoving all the plants that were growing there were actually telling a story. Some were growing there because the soil was really compact. Uh, some were indicators of um, pH uh, deficiencies to acidic soil. Uh, some were ac actively fixing nitrogen and putting that back in the soil, um, which was to the benefit of my vines, despite the fact that I was killing them off on a yearly basis. And some were generally naughty buggers because they were like quirk, for example, is allelopathic. So it gives off toxins through its roots and it inhibits the growth of plants around it, which would include the vines, but also that sort of natural diversity that you try and foster in the vineyard. It was a real re-education, and that was the first day, and that was scary to think of it, but that was 20 years ago already, and I'm, I'm still learning every day as we speak. I'm stuck. It's an amazing new journey to discover. Well, the one story I love is, um, you know, um, maybe the, the, the guys, on, the, the guys on, on this don't know that, South Africa's biggest problem in the, in the vineyards is a thing called leaf roll virus. And that's usually spread by humans or by uh, a thing called the mealybug. And, and I remember sitting there with you and you said, John was explaining to you that mealybugs are on your vines because they have no place to go. And their preferred home is the dandelion. And you ripped out or poisoned the dandelion. So they've got nowhere to go. And once that trick was fixed, you can live completely at peace with the mealybugs knowing that they're going to stay on the dandelions and they're not going to spread this leaf roll virus. Yeah, you know, it's absolutely right. It was fascinating. I think 
you know, to, to sort of explain it to people, yeah, people often want to know what, you know, what does organic farming mean? What does it entail? What is organic wine? And I often have people say to me, but you know, isn't all wine organic? It's like grapes and it ferments and makes wine. So every, all, all wine should be organic. Um, but it, it's not, it's, it's not in the vineyard and it's, it's also not in the cellar. It's actually quite different. Um, to me, the trick has been to differentiate between organic by design and organic by neglect. So if you look at the picture that you've just put on the screen, that's actually a very good place to start. Um, that's a photo of our Cabernet Franc vineyard, uh, one in front of my house as well. Uh, it goes into our cornerstone blend. And when I converted to organics, this vineyard initially went through a bit of a tricky phase for two years. And then I thought I got it right. And then overnight, the yield just dropped, went from a nice six to eight tons per hectare, all the way down to a two or three tons per hectare, which is, as we said, you know, from a financial point of view, not really sustainable. And it was very interesting because what I'd done is, um, I had, I, there wasn't a lot, other than John, a lot of um, information forthcoming out of South Africa in terms of how one should farm organic. So I hooked up with two gentlemen from Geisenheim University in Germany. And the one guy was a, a prof in biodynamics called Georg Meissner. And the other guy was an organic guru called Dr. Uwe Hoffmann. And Uwe Hoffmann explained to me that I'm actually farming with two things. I'm farming with vines in the short term, but I'm farming with soil in the long term. And if you look, if you take them at face value, they, they add odds. So anybody who's watching now has tried to grow vegetables or flowers or make a pretty garden as you know, knows very well that the first thing you do is you remove all the weeds and clear them away. So they don't compete with your plants for food and for moisture and stuff. But the moment you take a walk in wilderness, you go in Tokai Forest or Table Mountain or Yonkershoek or Port Laray Hills behind me, uh, you don't see that. You just never see bare soil unless it's a road that's man-made. Every little bit and piece of nature is covered. So for soil to live and to flourish, the soil needs to be covered by plants. But for us to farm commercially successfully, we need to sort of remove those plants to give our vines enough yield to make it a profitable exercise. And therein lies the, the balance that the organic farmer tries to achieve. So what the Uwe Hoffman said to me was that here in the Western Cape, we have probably the oldest and most extensively weathered vineyard soils anywhere in the world. Uh, our soils are much, much older than those of wine growing regions like the, the States or I don't know, France or Italy or Spain. And one way to check it is if you take a spade and you can dig a, a, a hole in a conventional vineyard here in the Western Cape where we live, or you fly over and you go and dig a hole in a vineyard somewhere in France in a conventional one, and you measure the humus content, you'll see that the humus content in their conventional vineyards are about two to three percent. And here, if you're lucky, on our farm, we got about 0 0.5 to 0 0.7 percent. So very little organic matter. And why that is so important for organic farming is that if you can increase the humus levels in the soil, you actually increase the, the resilience of the plants that grow there. And they've quantified it. If you can build your soil humus levels up to 5%, so if you could take that 0 0.5, 0 0.7, up to 5, then your plants, your vines that live in that area, their resilience increased by as much as 300%, be it against fungal disease or drought or anything else. So by looking after your soil, it actually becomes, in the long run, easier to look after your vines. So initially, if you take a short-term view, they're at odds. You have to sort of clean the soil for the sake of the vines. But if you take a long-term view of your vineyard, it's really crucial that you look after your soil first and foremost. So what we do is, like last year, we had a lack of winter. We had proper rain. Uh, the vines were growing like there was no tomorrow. 
and there was a nice yield hanging. And then I could say, well, you know, these guys aren't struggling. Let's really focus on the soil a bit. Let's lay off the weed management a bit. Let's just graze with the cows and whatever comes up, just try and flatten it with a tire or something. But if you go back three or four years ago when we had that drought, that was a very different scenario. Then the vines were struggling. And if I built the soil too much, my yield would be you know, too low. So there we were erring on the side of caution of the vineyards again. And we were a bit more vigorous managing weeds and stuff. So yeah, that's that, that sort of the first here. And the second one is what you mentioned was this, this idea of the dandelions. And it's essentially pests because we don't just have weeds as a challenge, we also have pests as a challenge. And as I'm sure the listeners or the, the, the you know, people on this, um, what, what do you call it? The Zoom meeting. Um, they're, they're, yeah, they're, they're, they're all people except for Zen. He's a little bit of a... <laughs> 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 but, I mean, anyway, so one of the big problems, I'm not sure if you guys know it or don't know it, but we've got a big thing called leaf roll virus in our vineyards. I'm not looking at the picture that you're showing there, and I'm not really seeing a lot of leaf roll virus in there. But generally at this time of the year, autumn, the leaves can go red. And sometimes they can go red before autumn, they can go red in harvest time already. And that's a big problem because what this virus does is it makes the vine not able to, to produce chlorophyll. And if it can't produce chlorophyll, it can't photosynthesize properly. And if it can't do that, then it can't ripen your grapes properly. So if you have a lacquer like glass of red wine like this and it's got some cab in it, and those grapes aren't properly ripen, then you're going to get very green, hard sort of tannin structure, which will never ripen and improve over time. It's, it's a big problem, it's incurable. And the only thing that people can actually do these days, if you have it, and it's so bad is you just have to pull out your whole vineyard and, and replant it at great cost in many years. But this virus, is, science tells us, is spread through the saliva of a little insect called the mealybug. And um, in the old days when I was uh, working on conventional farms, we used to put on a suit and a helmet and we had to spray this thing called Dersban because Dersban would kill the mealybugs and prevent them from spreading the disease in the vineyards. And then when I went organic and biodynamic, I stopped spraying that product. But despite doing so, I saw the leaf roll virus slowing its spread. It, it, it can't heal it, but it stopped spreading so quickly through the vineyards. And I, I didn't see these mealybugs that I was always spraying for. And then one night I lay in my bed and I read um, Weinboer Technis. And Weinboer Technis said that if you want to really kill mealybug on your farm, mustn't just sort them out in the vineyards, you must also make sure you get rid of all the dandelions and those type of weeds in your soil. Because these bugs have been known to migrate between the vineyard and those weeds. So then I thought, you know, is it possible? And I walked into the vineyard and I pulled out a dandelion and there they all sat on the root. And then the penny dropped, you know, this is their house. And if we go in and we destroy all of this and we make a clean floor and we only leave some plants on the side, all these hojos who live here only have one place to go and that's in the vineyards and then they become a problem. So you have two options. Either you can get like another poison that you kill insects with or you develop one to kill weeds with or you can leave some plants for them and then they climb back and they live back in the soil again. But it's again, it's a balancing act. You know, you have to, if you leave too many weeds, then you don't have enough yield, and then that's also not the solution. That's an ongoing, yeah, interesting, interesting uh, journey, very much so. Yeah, you know, I love, I mean, you know, I, how much I love this. Um, the, and, and, and so, so, okay, so, so you've got your grapes organic now, but you take it, you take it a step further. Cause the other thing that you were mentioning to me was that there are all these crazy people and with fires and stuff, or even with just maintenance of their thatch roofs, they would pay someone to get their thatch taken off. And, and you were saying, Hey, stop the bus. I will take that for free. And it's part of your biodynamic thing, which, so maybe quickly, what's the difference for you between organic and biodynamic? Well, I think it's exactly that. It, it's, 
it's, a, it's moving from being a sustainable farmer to being a self-sufficient farmer. In, its, in essence, that's what it's about. So I've picked my grapes. I need to put something back because I've taken off six tons per hectare. So if I'm conventionally following that thought process, I look at it scientifically and I say, well, I need to replace so much nitrogen, potassium, phosphates, trace elements. Then I go and buy that in a bag, I spread that in my vineyards and they all grow beautifully next year again. And I get a, a good harvest again. If I'm organic, I'm, I get that, but I want to go beyond that because that fertilizer is good for my vines. It makes them grow beautifully, but it's not so good for my soil. So if I use it continuously over time, it starts to acidify my soil, my earthworms, my microbes, the fungus, these guys get a bit of a, a buck slaw. And then I have to really, you know, um, think about that. So if I go and buy an organic fertilizer, what they do is they'll take something like chicken manure, they'll compost it, they'll pelletize it, and then you can apply this, you know, in the vineyards and get them to grow. So it's a source of nitrogen and everything that they need, but it's not going to kill your earthworms. It's not going to run out and get into the rivers and you have the algae bloom and not enough oxygen for the fish that live there and, and all of that. So that would be more sustainable. What the biodynamic farmer does is he or she goes out and buys a cow and then brings the cow to the vineyard. So why would a wine farmer bring a cow? It's really, it's about waste. So I say to people, if you, if you think of all the living things that we can see above us, in front of us, on the, in the soil that we walk on, there's only one animal that wastes, and that's us human beings. So nature never wastes. Waste is purely a cultural concept. And we waste a lot, you know, every time we eat breakfast, lunch or supper or drink something, it comes out of a packet or something that we have to chuck away. And it's expensive. It's expensive, expensive on the environment and on your pocket. So if you want to be more natural, if I can put it that way, you try and align different organic systems on a farm so that you reduce this concept of, of waste. So if you buy a cow on a wine farm, you take all the waste from the cow and you put that back into the vineyard. And at harvest time, you take all the waste from the cellar, the pips and the stems and the skins, and then you feed that back to the cows again. So the real difference for me between an organic and a biodynamic farm is that you take multiple organic systems, which are sustainable, and then you look at a sort of a creating synergies between them that they feed off each other. And then that moves it from a sustainable farm to a self-sufficient farm. But you don't have to just recycle your own waste. Sometimes there's an opportunity to get outside waste as well. And that was what you were talking about. So I saw people, with, I mean, I live in Stellenbosch. And close by to me is a town called Somerset West. And a lot of people in Somerset West have thatched roofs on their houses. And after 20 or 25 years, when that thatch starts breaking down, they have to get rid of it. So I saw all these thatch trucks driving on the highway one day, going dumping thatch somewhere. And then I just thought, well, you know, you're paying 500 bucks or a thousand rands a load to go and dump it at the dumping site where it becomes nothing. But why don't you come and dump it on my farm for free? And before I knew it, I had like 50 or 100 trucks of thatch on the farm and they were all dumping it. And it was a mountain of organic material. And all I did is I put it as bedding for the cows for six months. So they would then add all the microbes and stuff through their manure. And when those microbes start breaking down that organic matter, that's gold. Then you get compost and you get free fertilizer for your vineyards and you don't have to buy stuff from outside to you know, keep the system going. So it's that type of thinking that goes into biodynamic farming. So, yeah, yeah, you are flipping love this stuff. Um, so I think we, we might pop back onto it. Um, let's, let's, let's talk about the wines, because you've got a number of ranges. And actually, before we get into the wines, because we're talking about the money, and I remember, I remember in our chat, and subsequently, when you, and, and back then, the average price per hectare for farming and you said talking about ripping up vines, that's about 300,000 rand per hectare just to set up. 
But back mm. then was the average price in Stellenbosch to farm a hectare was um, 50,000 Rand per hectare. Mm. And your analysis without the pesticides and everything and in this holistic environment was around 35 or 40 or I don't know what it was, but it was cheaper. And, and, and then provided 37. 37, much more of a buffer against drought, mm. against mm. stuff that was going on. So mm. you're getting more for less. Yeah, I think, you know, to be fair, initially, um, not so. In the first two or three years, if you're converting from conventional to organic and biodynamic, mm. you'll find that, it's like we spoke earlier, it's a new environment for the vines. Uh, your soil is not necessarily healthy. They've been used to a lot of water and chemical fertilizers for their entire lives. Now, if you just take it away, they go into a state of shock. And as a consequence, your yields will dip. And that is the danger period. And that's also when most people panic. And that's also where you often have the biggest onset of disease for multiple reasons. One, you're just starting out. You're not quite on top of your game yet. You don't know how to handle the various stuff. Two is your vines are undergoing a serious stress and nature is programmed to eradicate weakness, you know. Your soils aren't healthy, so they don't have that extra resilience. So that's the most difficult part. But once the new, I don't know what one would call it, methodology or whatever starts working, it works beautifully. And what happened was my, my auditor actually came to me and said to me, look, Johan, this is very strange. You used to get eight tons per, per hectare, and now you only get six. Um, but somehow your, your business seems to be more profitable. Uh, how is that possible? And then we had a look and we saw, we looked at the everything and what, what had come down the most was the production costs. So if you think, you know, we live in a third world country, we're here in the bottom of Africa, but most of agriculture is owned or controlled by one or two or three big multinational corporations. And those guys aren't really interested in South African rands. If you buy from them, the prices are dollar or euro or GB pound or whatever uh, denominated. But if I go to my kraal and I collect daisy or clanky's manure, it just costs me the same every Friday. I, it's not going to cost me 20% more next year because the rand devalued or some politician said something funny or did something funny. So it's a, it's a complex game. It's different. You know, we, a lot of people talk to me about not just the profitability they offer, but of the risk element. You know, isn't it more risky to farm this way? And I think obviously it is. Um, people used to farm like this forever. Why did they stop doing this? Why did they stop using chemicals to farm? Uh, it's not because anybody liked spraying poison or wanted to spray poison. I think it just made the life of the farmer easier. It's easier to control a large field of weeds with a quick herbicide spray than it is to physically go and remove them or try and outgrow them with other plants. So it definitely made farming easier, but it also kind of, I want to say that you almost started borrowing from future generations because we were using up and degrading a lot of our soil life and our soil structure in the process. So now people are thinking about living in a more sustainable way and farming in a more sustainable way. And then they say to me, but you know, I'm worried about the risk because as it is, I'm not really making a lot of money being a farmer. And now you, you want me to go and become an organic farmer, which is even more risky. It's got, we've got all the business risks. Then we have the natural risks. And now you want to bring on a few additional natural risks as well. But it really depends how you look at it. If I look at, at wine, that is what I do. Um, I have to sell that wine. I can't just make it. And in the past, when I tried to sell that wine, um, and I was a nobody, it was very hard to get anyone to even, I mean, I remember right in the beginning, I used to send faxes to people overseas and asking them if they wouldn't um, try my wine. I'd send them the wine for free. And 99% of people wouldn't even reply to the fax that I sent them. Um, I'm sure they got hundreds of them and they were much, millions of much better wines rolled over for them to choose from. 
But the moment we started offering organic and biodynamic wine, it was a complete something unique, something different. And people were interested and asked me to start sending them samples. And it, I've, I experienced the same thing with shelf space. If you go to a, a wine store, if you go to a big chain, like let's say Waitrose in the UK, um, it's not very easy to get in there. And if you're in there, you're in there with the big boys, the guys with the big budgets and the, and the established brands, and they can chuck millions at it and get shelf space at eye height that the small guy can never compete with. But if you come with some, something unique and original and just different, it actually opens that up for you as well. So it is risky, but it depends how wide you look. If you just look at the farm, for sure, it's more risky and more difficult. But I would like to add it's more fun as well, or for me at least. But if you look at it wider or more holistically and you look at the marketplace and everything else, then I actually think you take a lot of the risk out of the marketplace and bring it to the farm. And if you're a farmer, that's what you want to do because you can only be overseas in the market for a couple of days a year, but most of the time you're on your farm and this is where you live and you can keep an eye on things. Yeah. Um, okay, let's, let's get on to the wine. So you've got your different ranges and... Um... I don't know, maybe you just want to just talk about them. We don't have wines with us. We've tasted the, we tasted the last time it was the organic Shannon, which people collected with pick and pay. I think everyone agreed mm -hmm. back then that for its price, it was the biggest hitter in terms of the quality of the wines that we had out of the first seven. So that was amazing. <clears throat> That's great to hear, man. Um, I've got it here. I, I got a few bottles just to show. So this is the organic Shannon. Um, it's one of three ranges. So what we do is we make an organic range, we make a high dynamic range, and we make a reserve range. So they're actually different products for different moments and different uh, requirements. So if you look at the organic range, the grapes grow primarily on sandy soils. And when vines grow on sandy soils, you often find less structure, if I can call it that less tannin, they're not so big and so bold, but you get more of a fruit profile in the wine. So organic range are essentially just that. They are wines that grow in more sandy soils, they're fruit driven, they're generous, they're easy to drink. And this is the wine that Mila and myself would drink most of the time at home. It's easy, it's uncomplicated, it's not very expensive, it's about 85 rand a bottle. And it is a proper certified to EU and NOP, which is American and Canadian standards organic wine. So it also includes not just what I spoke about in the vineyard, but very similar practices in the cellar. No DAP, no tartaric acid, um, no artificial yeast or whatever stuff that one uses. Regulated, monitored, and it's my go-to wine. And we focus on four cultivars there. So for us, where we live, I would say the reds would be Cabernet Sauvignon and Shiraz, and then the whites would be Sauvignon Blanc and Chenin. And we kind of work around those four, and then the organic range would be the accessible ones. And then if, if we step it up from that, I've got the biodynamic range here. So this one, I don't know if you can see on the bottle, but the label is a little bit smaller. Um, it's not as overtly, I don't know how good this picture is, man. But anyway, um, it's just a, yeah, so it's, it's a bit more of a premium product. You've, you're now going up to about 200 Rand a bottle. And what you find here is you find a wine that's, if you can afford it, it would be lucky to drink it every day. I can't drink a 200 Rand bottle of wine every night. But this is for dinners, dinner parties, if we go to friends or, you know, away on weekends or stuff, something like that. These uh, grapes grow higher up on the slopes. They grow on granite soils. So what granite does as opposed to sand is you don't have that fruity, easy drinking style of wine. It gives a lot, lot more structure on the reds. So more tannin, slightly drier finish. Um, but it also gives almost a minerality, if I can call it that, on the whites. So you've got the, the fruity notes, but behind it, you've got more length in the palate. You've got something a bit more serious. And you've got a wine that you know you can actually put away. You don't have to drink it in the first three or four years. 
you can keep it for a decade and it will probably just get better and better and yeah so that would be our biodynamic range and it's also those for, for, for cultivars and then I've got the reserve one here um, let's see if you can see this one it's hard to see because the label it doesn't really have a label it's kind of cut into the glass the Reinecke and then it's just got a little bit of a neck tag there so we also have four reserves a Cab, a Shiraz, a Shannon and a Sauvignon Blanc but they're different we don't make them every year so in the 20 years that we've made wine I think the Shannon we've only made twice uh, one year we only released 400 bottles of it uh, the reserve cab we probably have done four times uh, the Syrah and the Sauvignon Blanc a bit more often but they are more geeky wines um, we make them in really special years only it will be a barrel selection and the idea you know that's when I I pull in other people who know a lot more than I do about wine to help and, and decide on that because I think most of us have the, excuse my dog Philly, I, I don't know if you hear Philly's, but she's barking outside. I hope she's not making too much of a noise. But uh, um, she's a rescue dog, so she's, she can, um, yeah, she's lovely. Anyway, so the reserves, they, they're special. They're for collectors. Um, those are the ones that get the fancy smanchy ratings from the journalists. Um, those are wines that you keep. Uh, I know for my daughters, for example, um, Tallulah and Isabella, I've got some reserve wines from the years in which they were born. And my intention is to be drinking those wines at their 21st or special occasions like that. Yeah. That's it. That's the Reinecke range. But the reserve Shannon, and I, I don't know where that took. It, it was with Roland at Wine Cellar, and you came and gave a, a humbling talk. Um, but you, but that Shannon was uh, without the addition of sulfur. And you mentioned that you opened it up for a week, and you still drank it, and it was as fresh as um, a biodynamic daisy. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. I would say the reserve wines for me, probably, you know, I mean, I look at a reserve white. It's a Sauvignon Blanc. Most people think if you have a Sauvignon Blanc, you want to drink now or 2020 or 2019 Sauvignon Blanc. If I look at our reserve range, I'd probably be drinking at the youngest, 2015. Um, I had a 2012 the other day, which was absolutely su superb. So those wines really are, you know, I, I, you know Miguel Chan. Yeah. So for our colleagues, uh, Miguel is a is a top som um, in South Africa. He comes from Mauritius, and he had a look at this wine. I think it was the seventeen. It could have been the fifteen. It's the reserve white. I don't know if you can see it, but he opened a bottle and he drank that single bottle over the course of a month. So he had poured out a little bit. I don't know where he got the discipline. I, my record is probably two days, but if you can, otherwise you just open more than one bottle, but try and drink it over a month. And he did a Facebook post on it. It was very interesting to see how the, the wine develops and opens up and evolves over time. So I think the, the reserve wines really have a, a look to the future. And uh, what I say to you, uh, well, uh, why I involve myself with, with, with serious tasters then is we all have the ability to taste the present. You know, I can, this is a, a new cab organic range that we can we just put in bottle now. And I can look at the fruit in here and that's, you know, I get a bit of sort of a, a bit of um, graphite there and some, some, maybe a bit of cedar wood. And, you know, I can taste on the palate. It's quite smooth and easy to drink. But what I struggle with is to see what this wine is going to do in five years' time, what it's going to look like, what it's going to look like in 10 years' time, and what it's going to look like in 15 years' time. And guys with really smart, sharp palates have that ability to almost see the future. So what we do is, if we have a special, special year, uh, 
we'll get uh, Nushka to draw samples for us from the barrels and then just write up little numbers on the bottles because if you go into the cellar, you're so prejudiced, you know. This one in the corner is my favorite barrel. I don't really like that one at the back. Your mind starts playing games even before you've tasted the wine. But you get someone else to draw them, to mark them, and then we'll have them around the table and we'll have an international panel and we'll make notes and think of the wines now and going forward and how they would be. And um, yeah, if we get up to something really special, that becomes a reserve wine. Yeah. I hope that makes sense. Harry, can I, I ask see a question? Yes, of course. Please do. Please <laughs> do. Johan, please could you tell me how does a Sauvignon Blanc taste after additional age? Because, yeah, two years, three years, but I've never tasted a five or eight year Sauvignon Blanc. How, does the, how do the characteristics change over time? Okay, so I think it's important to know that our Sauvignon Blanc tastes a little bit different from what one would expect from a Sauvignon Blanc. So if you look at, let's say, the world of like wine, and you have, it's a like a what? It's like a Chardonnay. <laughs> <laughs> it's not true. <laughs> <You're nonsense. laughs> so if you, if you look at a New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, it can be very green, very racy, uh, it very fresh and very, yeah, it sort of jumps out the glass, very aromatic. And then if you look at something from France, say Puy Fumé, Sancerre or whatever, it's not going to be, it's going to be a bit more elegant, but you're going to have more uh, sort of length on the palate, more mouthfeel, um, yeah, more body to it, if I can put it that way. So our souvenir bank is a little bit different from most South African souvenir blancs. Most South African souvenir blancs tend to be more like a New World style, more like the New Zealand fresher aromatic style. Mm -hmm. But because we farm organically and biodynamically, we also want to make wine that way. And what that means is that we don't want to inoculate and control and make the wine in the cellar we want it to be terroir driven. So we want to interfere as little as possible with the grapes to get them to the wine. So what we do is what one would call an, a wild yeast ferment. So you don't inoculate with yeast, you don't feed with diammonium phosphate, you do none of that. And if you look at the traditional way that you make sauvignon in South Africa, you would put it in stainless steel tank, you would make it really cold, the juice cold, you would put in some dry ice or carbon dioxide to get the oxygen away, make a really reductive style, which is aromatic, fresh, new world style sauvignon. If you try and do that with a wild yeast, the wild yeast is very delicate. It's not nearly as aggressive as the commercial yeast. And it's gonna to struggle to finish the job in that cold sort of reductive environment. And if it struggles to ferment properly, it gives off flavors and off odors in the wine. So what we've done is we've opted to stick to the natural wild yeast ferments and stuff and just to change the, the vehicles in which we ferment. So we ferment in things like clay amphora, oak barriques, that's not too cold where the wine can breathe. And what this does is it gives you, it, not as aromatic style sovi, but more mouthfeel style sovi. So if you look at it at a young age, okay. say, if I drank a biodynamic or a reserve white now, they would probably have a lot of lime, a lot of floral notes, um, a, a very much a sort of a steeliness, almost a, a tension in the wine, a lot of minerality, sort of a flintiness that you get in, in, in the wines. Um, and if I leave them five years to 10 years, that sort of lemony, a limey, zesty flavor becomes more of a riper, grated orange peel. So they just become richer, rounder, more full-bodied flavors. But if I did it with a wine that, it, it's funny, I'm, I'm not a scientist, so I don't quite know how it works. But if you do it with a, a normal sauvignon that was made in a reductive way, I find that they take up oxygen or they oxidate a lot quicker. And if the wine in the fermentation process is free to take up oxygen through the barrels and the stuff, they don't oxidize as quickly. 
So whether you open the bottle now and drink it over four or five days, it's not going to be wine you just want to cook with on day three. It's actually going to probably be more impressive on day three than on day one. And you can also do five or ten years. But you couldn't do that with our organic range. So our organic range is more for now, for fresh. You want to drink the 19 or the 20 or at most maybe an 18. But if you yeah. keep it for longer than five years, it's going to start falling apart. It's going to be a bit flabby. Not going to develop uh, along those lines. Yeah. Uh, so but, uh, cool. Thank you. No, thank you. That's yeah. brilliant. <laughs> okay. Cheers. I was, I was supposed to, um, in terms of the new Love and Time of Corona, keep a lot of time control. We're sitting at six o'clock. There's a few things I want to ask you, Jan. So, which do you love the most? Because you've spoken about wine. Do you love your wife? Do you love Kate? Do you love surfing? Or do you love Zen? <laughs> what? So you have to start again. I think the, the obvious answer is my wife, but what were the other options? No. So, so I know that your, your, your priorities in life doesn't yeah. matter. I want to order things. Surfing, karate, family, wine. Mm. That's it for you, eh? Wow, man. I love all of them. And I think you can throw my dogs and my, my cows into the mix as well. Um, we even caught a rat in the kitchen yesterday. There's, and, a, song. Uh, There's a song by UB40. <laughs> <laughs> I know. But <laughs> and like most people, I don't know what they do if they catch a rat. But... I, I can't, I can't kill it. So we had to catch it in a little hockey and take it up the mountain and release it. I've actually got a video of it. Getting, it eaten, by, getting eaten by an eagle. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. <laughs> so, no, but, no, man, I'm a, I'm, I'm a lover, not a fighter. But I love. No, but listen, uh, yeah. Johan, this is this is very important for me because this was something that came through not when uh, I chatted to you the first time, but when Ian and I came and we were looking at the drone thing. And um, yeah. in terms of security, you know, we were looking, how can we use yes. to, to, to protect the farm? And we're not going to get into that detail. But I remember the one thing that you said to me, and you said it just now, it's not a social upliftment, and upliftment is about the environment, the people, and then the cash. And mm. we can talk about what you do for the people, and that's another whole story. It's an amazing story. But... Um, and, and it brings to light that your, your mind works differently to most because you're always looking to see how you can prove it for everyone. And the mm. discussion got down to what happens if you catch someone who is stealing from you? And I remember your response very, very clearly. It was, well, the first thing you have to do, Harry, is you have to find out if he's a scabango or not. Um, whether he's a criminal, <laughs> just desperate. And if he's desperate, we need to help that man. Do you remember? I do. Yeah. No, I, you know, my mom always told me I must try and understand why people do stuff. It's not always easy to remember that. But um, no, I, you know, especially in these times, I, I'll tell you a story. Um, I actually wrote it for Christian Eads in his wine mag quiz the other day. But he asked me about coronavirus and where are we heading and how many wineries are going to fold and what is my own take on it and what am I going to do and am I going to stick it out? And I, I gave it a lot of thought. Um, and there's a lot to be happy about and a lot to be sad about and it's a lot of binary thinking. It's either the economy or the people. And, uh, you know, I'm not like that. I try to not along those, those lines. And I want it to be both the economy and the people, not either or. But as I was... Uh, as I was driving, I was down uh, looking at the cows at the bottom in the kloof there. And then my phone rang. And it was this guy called Saki. And uh, Saki, you know, we've got permanent people on our farm. We've got people who you know, I've been with forever, as long as I've been here. And they're very fortunate because they get homes and they get salaries and they get retirement annuities but it's a small group and we've got a small group in the in the cellar who've also been with us for a long time and they also you know we're a team and it's it's a lack of team and we look after each other but it happens from time to time that we need extra hands on deck 
at harvest time, for example, or when we're bottling or labeling, for example. And these people I feel for because they are sitting at home. They're not permanent employee. Nobody can do anything for them. And Saki was their supervisor. So what we've done is, I mean, we can't really fix everything, but we just thought we'll go and speak to Man, which is the guy that we use in the vineyards, and Saki, who is the guy whose team helps us in the cellar from time to time, and just ask how the guys at home are, you know, what are they doing? And Man sent me a video clip of kids breaking in through a shop right roof somewhere in just a river of Akasa or somewhere, just trying to get their hands on some food, which was quite a shocking video to see. And here I'm looking out the window and I just see vineyards and mountains. And then I thought, okay, you know, I can't pay them salaries. I mean, I'll bankrupt the farm, but what we can do is we can work on a food parcel. But you must imagine it's not one person, it's like 15 or 20 people. So it's a lot of money if you have to buy food for so many people in the vineyard and, and so many in the cellar. And I was going to buy bread and I don't know what one buys, bologna or whatever. And then mom said to me, no man, just give me the money. Um, bread is too expensive. We'll just buy meal and stuff. We'll work on about 400 and I think 50 rand for a family a week. And so the phone rang and it was Saki and Saki was just saying, hey, oh, Johan, thank you so much. And I thought, yeah, that's nice of him to phone back and say, say thank you so much. It's just a decent thing to do. And I was like, pleasure, Saki, have a lucky day. And he said, no, but I, I must just tell you, uh, this lady come in this afternoon and since lockdown started, it was the first time that she could afford a potato. And the, she came to me to tell me about the sensation of putting the potato in her mouth and how amazing it was to just taste the potato. And then I just thought, yes, bro, you know, we've got so much to be grateful for and we're so lucky. And I know we're locked up and I'd love to go surfing and I was a bitch and moan about a whole bunch of other stuff. But to think there are people there who... Who, who, who are grateful just to be able to taste a potato. And when, when I hear stuff like that, it's almost as if this corona thing grinds. Grind. You know, I'm, I'm running a business and it's always been about being a successful business and building the brand and sticking to your principles. And when corona came, I was like, how are we going to do this? Never waste the crisis, look for opportunity, think out of the box make a plan, bake a cake, whatever. But when this lady said that, it just kind of put a proper, it just sort of stopped me in my tracks. And I realized that, you know, there are people who are just staying alive out there. And if I think of it that way, it makes this, this business or any business for that matter, a lot more beautiful. Because what it does is it doesn't just make money or build a brand or make wine. It actually looks after people, it employs people, it helps people, it puts food on the table. It means a lot to people. And I think whatever wine you're going to drink, whether you drink Reineke wine or whatever wine you have in your glasses tonight, just think of that, that by drinking wine and supporting this product, it's not just the berries or the minerality or the whatever that's important. You are tapping into a much bigger picture, making a, an awesome thing happen behind the scenes that I think a lot of consumers are not aware of. So therein, I think, is a, a lot of value for us as, as, as wine drinkers. You know, we, we support an industry that, that really makes a difference where people are not often aware of it. So, yeah, I don't know if I'm over my... I see it's no, you're not. It's not. It's not about. Already, over, it's definitely not about over the time. It's um. Yes. I remember. I remember. Um, I remember chatting to you, and and I don't know if you implemented it. I think you did, or you were going to. It was about the guys that had lived on the farm forever, and I've, I think I've even relayed the story to this group, and mm. it seems like a nice idea when you've got the people who work for you every year, but they are almost bound there because they live in your house. And if they were to stop working, then they'd lose the house. 
Mm. And your idea was that this is not ideal because the kids or the teenagers that are growing up in this environment don't necessarily want to be in wine. And your, your take on it was, okay, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll, I'll convert some of those places into Airbnb or rental mm. accommodation. I will buy a house. It may not be the best house, but it'll be a house sitting in a township, mm. which means that that teenager or that family can move there and they can start doing IT. They can start doing whatever they want to do. They're not preordained for the rest of their life to be in, in wine. And mm. the model works well because once that house is paid off, then you buy another one. And another, mm. I'm not sure. I, mean, I remember you definitely giving me that idea. I'm not sure if you did it or, but it's that kind of thinking that is the most important thing. Harry, absolutely. So what we did is we, we bought four houses. We made a deal. It, and so what happened was growing grapes didn't cut it for me. I was always poor, couldn't have money for groceries, let alone pay my bills. And I realized that in the world that we are now, you know, yeah, you need a pretty big farm if you want to live off just selling grapes. So what does a philosopher do, you know? I, mean, I, I can't really get a job. So I had to mark a plan. And I thought the best thing to do would be to add value, make wine from the grapes, because then you can actually make money. But there wasn't a winery. So it was a humble story with a little cow shed. And I had two cows there, Daisy and Clanky. And I moved them out and I made some wine. And then I invited the bank manager with my colleagues, my fellow farm workers, and said to them, please lend us a couple of million because you know, we've made this really basic wine, but with a broom that we cut the bristles off in one barrel that we opened, help us so we can buy a press and some tanks and some lacquer machines and, and, and do a proper job. This man was a very kind man, but he was also wise and he also had responsibility as a banker. And he said to me, I love your, your intention, but please don't do it. Because very rich people lose a fortune in the wine business. Now, you, Johan, have no formal background in commerce or viticulture or our knowledge. So, no. And most of your colleagues who work with you are illiterate. I mean, some of the people literally made a cross on their contract when they had to sign the contract. So for us to move into this wine world and be successful was admirable, but not good. So don't do it. And I still, it was before 2008. So you, they weren't as strict to lend you the money that you had to have the surety and the serviceability. You just had to have a plan and they would lend you the money or whatever. And I had the plan and he would lend me the money, but he strongly advised against it. And then my colleagues declined because these ads were really poor. They could not even afford a bicycle, uh, or if they did, it was cherished. You know, it was a spe special possession. And now they had to go and stand up, and be part of a, a group that borrowed millions of rands to, to start their own wine business. And when the man from the bank told them it wasn't a good idea, they saw that. And then they came to me and they said, you know, Johan, thanks for this, but no thanks. Um, we like the, the idea and the sentiment, but you know, we don't have a bicycle or a car. Now we must go and borrow a fortune. And this guy says we're going to probably end up losing it. So I was reading the work of an Indian guy, a guy called Amartya Sen. He was a, a, also a philosopher, but in a development theory. And Sen said, if you want to empower people, you give them choice. Um, you don't, you know, you take away a person's choice, you take away their power. If you give them the capability to choose, you empower them. So I thought that was a lack of way to think about it. And then I had a discussion with my colleagues and I said, well, guys, if you could choose, what would you like? If the winery is not your thing, what do you want? And they all put up their hands and said, we want housing and we want education. We want to, our kids to have a proper education that we could never have. And in terms of housing, it's lack of on your farm but in order to live here we have to work here it would be nice if we could have our own properties so if our children wanted to work on the farm they could but if they wanted to become a doctor or a policeman or a whatever they could do that as well so we started off on that journey found an estate agent 
bought people houses. It's a long story. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but it had highlights. The highlight for me was probably meeting Mandela through the whole thing, through CNN. The low light for me was that half the people actually just sold their houses and took the cash. And when that happened, I realized that that was not what we intended. And initially I was angry. I thought, yes, you know, I put my farm up for risk. I don't have money as it is. Now I'm paying bonds on your houses to help you. And all you can think of doing is just like sell them and pocket the cash. And what had actually happened was in time, I was thinking maybe I had set these up, uh, up for failure. You know, they're not literate, let alone financially literate. They have now to do maintenance and rates and taxes and stuff. They have no idea how to do to, to budget or cash flow or anything. So we stuck it out. Half the people sold their houses, half the people retained their houses. Um, and then a couple of years ago, we also said, okay, what we'll bring into the mix as well is a retirement annuity, um, just as a, an option. So now I've got a, a young guy, his name is Long, or Ricardo is his real name. And he's now been with me for 10 years. And that means he qualifies for a house. So I wouldn't be buying him the house cash because I don't have the money to do so, but I would be making payments on his bond for him starting now until it's paid off. Or I can take that same amount of money and put it in a, let's say, an Alan Gray balance fund for him. And Ricardo opted now for the balance fund because he just said, you know, uh, I'm scared to go and live in the house in wherever. I don't know how to budget or to cash flow. I'm happy still to live with my parents on the farm next door. Um, i rather for now put my money in, 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 in the balance fund for me. So it's a, it's a bit of a work in progress. Um, like farming organically and biodynamically, I don't think there's a silver bullet. I, think, I don't think you ever finish it off or you have arrived or ticked all the boxes. It's, it's sort of a changing environment. And as the environment changes, you sort of try and adapt to the best of your ability. And I think ultimately what you want to do is you want to lead a meaningful life. So if you have a business, is the intention just to make money or is the intention to use the opportunity to give something to the people and something to nature and something to yourself? And that kind of works with me. So, so Johan, I'm going to finish it off now and I'm going to let people ask some questions. But, yeah, it's, it is changing. And, and you, you start messy or you just do it and then you, you need to change it. But there is one consistent and that's your thought process. And that's your, and there's not many people like that. I mean, even out of the, the, the kindest people, there, there's not many people who are Johan Reneke in that he is so thoughtful of everyone and everything and the greater good. So that is consistent. I mean, from all of the stories, through the winemaking, through... So that's pretty amazing. And that's why you're the silver surfer and not the copper silver surfer. <laughs> Thanks, Harry. That's very kind, Drew. Oh, no, uh, I, I, I beg to differ. I actually think everybody is like that. I just think it hasn't come out yet or there's something keeping it in. But we all want to help each other. You realize uh, everybody is like it. People want to be nice and be kind and help each other. And, you know, it's, um, I think we're all special. I think just sometimes life gets in the way or it's difficult. Or, but it, it, uh, what, uh, what helped me was my mom. Um, my dad was a, and still is a very well educated person. He's a professor and medical doctor and I don't know, a whole bunch of degrees behind his name. My mom never finished her matric, but she was uh, wise. My dad was clever, my mom was wise. And if you really had your back against the wall and you needed to know what to do in a specific uh, situation, you would ask my mom, what is the right thing to do? And she knew what was the right thing to do. So I guess some of that stuff rubbed off and um, yeah, she was a very, very kind person, and I, I learned a lot from her. But I also, like I said, I believe we've got some of that in all of us. 
uh, we must just let it come out, and allow it to come out. It's, it, it, it might be vulnerable to, to do it, but it's worth it. Thank you, man. So listen, guys, anyone want to ask questions? Um, a lot. We haven't even spoken about surfing and um, the Vindness Classic or Miller's Art or, I mean, there's so much, but let's just, um, if anyone wants to ask a question and then we can get into uh, Harry, I, I, I just wanted to butt in because um, we had a tasting, I can't remember when it was, it was early March, which seems like a year ago, um, but just a few months ago. And we were, you, you were, you, you were testing us on different wines that we might want to have on our wine tour. Um, and we all decided on the Rainica with the story and everything. Um, and that was going to be our new, our new wine. But listening to this, I've, I'm, I've never been so more inspired by wine. Um, so I think it's a, a sealed deal. But you know, you know, uh, Johan, what we did last year for the We Are Africa tour is that um, the theme was, um, it was surf adventures and we had Kubus Jubei on and he was talking about natural surfboards and then there's the guy from Mamawatu. And then um, we had, um, and then uh, I gave a tasting on the beach and um, we had the <laughs> Rainica awesome. wine. So we had, um, the, we had the American, we had the American um, press tasting Rainica wine before Kubus and uh, one of the other tour guides, Josh, Took them surfing at Landadna. <laughs> <laughs> no, and it was everyone. It was Condé Nast, the Sunday Times, um, the Daily Mail, and then um, <laughs> and ha and Harry doesn't fo feature in any of the photographs. Yeah, because I don't um, like. <laughs> he maybe didn't wear his floral outfit on the day. Well, that's it. <laughs> Yeah, Harry, I love surfing, man. I am. Um, wow, that's amazing. I don't know where you got that pic. I got that it on the website. So that pic is Kleinmont. Uh, I would guess around about 1994, 95, maybe even before that. That's uh, my wife, Mila. And um, this is on the rocks at Kleinmont Beach. Um, yeah, I've loved surfing in my entire life. Um, I don't know why it means so much to me, but it is, uh, it, I love it. I love it. Always have, always will. I try and surf about three times a week if possible. And I have since I could, which was probably 13 or 14 years old. Very special. The sea is, uh, whether I surf or just go for a swim or just go for a walk on the beach, I've never done it, or maybe on one or two occasions out of the thousands of times I've done it and, and not felt better afterwards. I always felt good when I go to the beach or go for a swim or go for a surf. If I come back, I always, you know, it lifts my spirit. Spirit, very special place. Mountains also very special. Yeah. Awesome. Anybody got questions for Jan? He's very shy. <laughs> Johan, I was going to ask, do you, are you trialing any other different types of varietals? Is there anything that you are playing with, so to speak? <laughs> yeah, we are, you know, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a, it's, an, it's the, we're giving it a lot of thought. Um, it was a very interesting thing that happened. We, our farm is on a hill about 10 kilometers outside Stellenbosch. And it faces northeast, east, southeast, southwest, and west. So and everywhere. It faces everywhere. Yeah, ex yeah it's crazy. <laughs> eh? Except proper north. So just not north, but around it. And, and the difference in altitude is between 100 and 300 meters above sea level. So we've got a, a gain of 200 meters on the farm. And we've got different blocks of the four cultivars that I mentioned to you, Shiraz, Cabernet, Sauvignon, and Chen, and planted on different uh, pockets of the farm. And over the last 10 years or so, we noticed the flavor profile of the grapes change. So our favorite Shiraz block, that used to give a lot of sort of white pepper, as global warming happened or 
less rain or the temperature got warmer, started giving less pepper. And some of the other blocks that were a bit austere in the past actually started giving beautiful pepper notes. And then I had a block of Cabernet where I always thought I made a big mistake because I planted it too high facing the sea and the fruit would never ripen properly. And the last couple of seasons, we've actually got our reserve cab out of that block. Uh, it doesn't ripen properly every year, but when it does, it's, it's like super special. So we're lucky we've got this lady called Rosa Krier. I don't know if you guys have met Rosa or know her but she's a, a very astute uh, wine person and a viticulturalist. And she is part of the old vine movement in South Africa, but she's also a consultant to a number of wineries. And uh, Luisa is working with me and helping me. And we're looking at two things. One is the possibility of introducing different varietals um, from a sort of a, a, a climatic change perspective. And the second one would be just to improve on the current uh, varietals that we have with blending partners. So for example, this year we planted some semi or uh, bush vine for the first time. And the idea would be that in maybe five years or 10 years from now that we would blend that into the reserve white uh, as it would be a good component for the for the uh, Sauvignon Blanc. We're also looking at Mouvert or maybe some warmer varietals going forward and then we're playing with the dynamics of the vineyard vines uh, to bush vines and to change row directions so that we've got an onshore flow every morning from about 10 o'clock onwards we get this southerly breeze come off false bay and if we change our, if we plant bush vines and we change the road direction, we'll have that cold wind come up from the sea and run all the way through the vineyards, also influence and cool down things a bit. So it is a, it is, a, it's, it really is very interesting um, times now with the change and how to adapt and what to do and, and where to go. Okay. Yeah, and I want to show you a picture. This is from Craig and Nat. The sun's gone down now, but I just thought now it's before the sun went down. Can you see? Mm, let's put a little bit back. It looks like in the sea. <laughs> yeah. No, but it's from their house. But check here. It was a whale. A we whale. got. Oh wow! We got a fright. Go back. You didn't see it Yeah, we, we. You were in the middle of talking, and we just heard this crash, and the dogs barking, and all of that stuff, and we rushed outside. And it was right in front of our house breaching our first well of the season. Oh, what a blessing. I've sent what you I'm sending it to you, Jan. I've sent it to you. No, your... please, man. But please, please don't me. use your phone. Don't use your phone while we're doing this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks for the well. Eh? Wells. Um, it's awesome. Thanks anyone got any, anyone got any other questions for uh, for you? Yeah, Harry. Um, sorry, Johan, um, you've been insanely inspiring. I can't absolutely wait to come to your farm. <coughs> the biodynamics fascinates me. I, yeah, I'm so sad that the lady who told you about all of this originally, the older lady, has passed mm -hmm. away. I can only imagine what an amazing person she was. But I've got a completely random question because you've answered everything. I, have, I can't ask you a decent wine question. But um, that painting behind you, I'm totally taken by it. It's so beautiful. And it just, <laughs> yeah. beautiful. So, uh, yeah, I'd love you. to know who, who did it. And it, I think it fits so nicely with your, your talk today. But yeah, if you could tell us who painted it, it would be great. Oh, well, thank you kindly. So that beautiful lady you saw on that photo sitting next to me in Claymont, um, she's the artist. The wife. Yeah. yeah, it's my wife. Miller, Miller is a very, very prominent South African artist. If you do want to duck, thank you, Johan, so much. Seriously, flipping amazing. Yeah, Harry, I've, I'm, it's been great. I, um, what can I say, man? Thank you for having me on the group. Yeah. It looks like you guys are an amazing group. Um, don't stop. 
please don't. <laughs> it onwards and upwards from here. And when this is over, uh, please come and visit. Come to the farm. Come work with me in the vineyards. I would love to show you my whatever. Anything. He's thanking from brand new organic veggie patch. What about it? You can show us your spanking brand new uh, organic veggie patch. I will. How do you know about it? You told me. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, please do. <laughs> come for a walk and come and check our, our cows. will start calving soon. Come and check them out. Uh, chickens are having little baby chicks everywhere. I actually had to stop the bucket this afternoon and chase away a crow that was trying to catch the baby little chicks on the way to this Zoom tasting. But um, yeah, man, have fun wherever you are. Have a lacquer glass of wine. And thank you for supporting South African wine industry and global wine industry and yeah, man. extended family to be a part of. So my door is open. Have a good evening. And we you guys are welcome wait. anytime. We can't wait to come there. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, and enjoy those whales and the beautiful view out your window. Bye. I miss the sea. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. Guys. It was our first Corona, loving Corona, and we loved it. Thank you.